my uh, my next story carries on again on this idea of of um you know groups and and what people can do together if they sort of pool their resources and pool their knowledge and and this brings together two of my favorite subjects which are gaming and cognitive neuroscience now <laughs> It sounds more weird than you think. Uh, gaming often gets a bad rap um, from people. You know, they talk about, does it make our kids stupider? Does it make our kids more antisocial? Does it make our kids more violent? Uh, on and on and on this gets talked about. But there are also um, positive things that could be coming out of gaming. And this week's story is about a game called StarCraft II, which is um, a real-time strategy game. It's similar to StarCraft and WarCraft, uh, all of all of those games our readers may have heard of. The idea basically is that you are, are a god-like being and you are playing against another god-like being, another human generally. And you both start off very small with like a little base camp. Maybe you've got like a little mine and you've got a couple of minions and you can start mining for resources or gathering resources, maybe chopping down wood, whatever the case may be. Um, that's more sort of WarCraft. But the, the same principle. And then as you accrue resources, you're able to do things like build factories which can make more people or can make starships or can make you know ways to wage war or all kinds of things so you end up building a civilization that gets um, more and more sophisticated now you the whole idea is that this is a battle so you're not building it to live a peaceful uh, live in a peaceful society you're building it so you can flatten the other guy and generally the quicker the better you don't generally know exactly what the other guy's up to. That's sort of hidden. Um, and, and you'll, I mean, based on personal experience, the first you'll know of it is when one of his scouting parties twigs to you and then you realize if you're up against a good player, you've probably got a few minutes before it's all over and messily so. Anyway, that's StarCraft. So for for a long time now, it's been thought that humans are just naturally not terribly good at multitasking. It, it's not only men who are crap at it, but women too. But what they're seeing with StarCraft players is that they're very good at multitasking because they're generally looking at, they're, they're watching their base and they're watching the activity there and people off gathering resources and people training people and, you know, stuff building things. But they'll generally have various parties involved in various battles all over the map. Uh, they could be in very, very different places on the map, so they've got to zoom around a lot. They've got to be keeping track of a number of different things. On top of this, they also have to have very good coordination because they control each one of their fighters singly and tell each one of them what to do and they could get up to relatively sizable armies um, all of which are using different strategies depending on what type of like a little fighter they've got or it just gets really really involved um, and the best players are capable of um, making sort of five to six actions uh, per second which is is biblically fast you can go online and actually see um, see the, the fights as they happen among some of the top players and the action moves almost too fast to track and these guys are it's actually amazing. yeah and these guys are making decisions behind it i mean it's it's extraordinary so with that background cognitive neuroscientists have been like "Ooh, this looks very 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 interesting what can we learn here and and um they talk about you know chess being the the drosophila of cognitive science so it's sort of it's been a really good model um and for 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 scientists to, to help to understand sort of thinking and cognition back to think about all the chess machines that are being built or, and have been built and so forth. StarCraft 2 they reckon might be the, the rhesus macaque so even better as a model because it's it's far more complex so it's a lot more difficult to study but could potentially be far more rewarding in terms of what it spits out and what they've been able to do is they've been able to get the replay logs um, and a replay log is basically every action that a player makes during the game is recorded by the computer on which they're playing and or the system with which they play and they've they've gotten thousands of these logs from players from all different levels and the idea is to sit down and start to um start to compare them all to see you know what is differentiating the the top players from the bottom players obviously they're, they're faster and better but what is actually going on can they start to derive some sort of sort of cognitive um rules out of this possibly hints for the rest of us that that would be nice certainly uh, on how to be better better multitaskers and and one of the big things is that it looks like some of the skills that are learned during games like this are transferable so with chess for example the skills that you learn in chess are not generally transferable to other things whereas some of the skills here, particularly around visual acuity behind the ability to make very fast decisions, look like they might actually be transferable. So there's also potentially in this ways to train people to deal with, for example, emergency situations, but be able to deal with them with a cool head and make the necessary decisions really quickly. We'll, we'll keep watching it. As always, this is ongoing, but, but superb to see that gaming is, you know, really, really contributing to science.
And at this point we should probably also note that this is by far and away not the first instance that gaming and science have uh, have overlapped quite considerably. Oh, yeah. There are there are numerable instances of this. The one that springs to my mind because I'm really a desperate wannabe virologist <laughs> <laughs> rather than a physicist. Um, is uh, back in 2007 there was uh, an epidemic outbreak in the online uh, massive multiplayer game World of Warcraft and the epidemic in question followed a lot of the attributes of a real world epidemic so people came in to visit the afflicted people and then they went away and they took the plague with them and they it had all of these consequences both in game and then uh, a bunch of researchers actually got on board with this and studied it and got a couple of papers in uh, uh, in various big name journals, one of them was published in Science, I believe. Uh -huh. uh, and and since then, they've suggested doing it again in a controlled manner to try and test out different responses uh, in terms of a medical or a social response to the actual particular epidemic and trying it out in game. Because of course, it's completely unethical to try different responses <laughs> like this and to to test the responses against each other in real life when real human lives are on the line. But something like World of Warcraft or, or Second Life, it can be a, a reasonable uh, model of reality mm -hmm. in order to get some general ideas going. Obviously there are big problems because, you know, in these games death is more of an inconvenience and less of a permanent thing, but uh, it, it is definitely interesting and I'm really looking forward to seeing some more research in this particular field just so I can sit around and play games, I think. Well, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, hooray, hooray, <laughs> hooray for the gamers. <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking of um, challenges in, in learning things, uh, one of our, so this is our, the first of our side blogs uh, stories this week, uh, our blogger Alison Campbell, who, who is bi author of Behind Bioblog, uh, attended a learning sorry, a teaching, a first year teaching biology conference at Victoria University of Wellington. And she notes uh, the keynote speaker, uh, a scientist by the name of Pauline Ross, who's at the School of Natural Sciences from the University of Western Sydney, and has won a whole slew of different awards and uh, certificates and whatnot. Uh, she eventually boiled down teaching biology into the problems with it, boiled down to six key facts. Um, and I'm just going to run through them quickly because as a biology student, I can certainly relate to some of these. And uh, given the last few stories we were talking about, it will be really interesting to see how these two will work together in the future. So first off, the big issue with biology is content. There's so much and we're constantly discovering so much that uh, textbooks are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think if they get too much bigger, they're going to collapse into something like a black hole <laughs> that you have to carry about in your search with you all day. So the idea here is that perhaps instead of studying the basics all the time and getting every single aspect of the basics, that once you have a framework to learn, you start studying the most modern ideas. And that reinforces uh, science as a a, a kind of a knowledge base that's constantly in flux rather than just huge screeds of facts and figures mm. that you have to memorize because that's that's not science i agree I, when i was studying um at university one of the subjects i studied was organic chemistry which is an absolutely enormous field it packs out entire libraries just on its own and we were being required to memorize this admittedly fantastic textbook but huge textbook for an exam it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages long and rather than testing for the most part i mean occasionally they did but not often our ability to think you know could we design experiments could we did we understand conceptually what was going on we had to memorize 30 amino acids and their left and right conformations because as a working scientist you'd need to have that sort of thing memorized i am being sarcastic at this point of course one would not you'd be able to look it up <laughs> and it's, it seemed completely the wrong way to do it. so you, so you end up with a whole lot of people who are very good at sort of spitting back facts but have never been taught how to think about stuff and that's the big second one in this list. It's process and context. It's how to gather facts and then turn them into uh, a framework that you can use to predict the results of future experiments rather than just collecting these huge piles of, of facts that are all completely independent and unrelated. So she also notes being able to put these in a framework is crucial and then she talks about inquiry as well and this is something I'm quite passionate about because inquiry is just crucial. So you give the students uh, something, some kind of framework to study or look at and you let them figure out what the answer is by themselves, by designing experiments, by going out and doing research, by anything else, but uh, here the idea is increasing engagement 
and that promotes learning. Mm. Um, the fourth thing is obvious, it's jargon and removing as much jargon as possible. Mm. Obviously in science there are a list of jargon terms that you do have to memorize and learn, but personally I find that that comes with doing these first three, by getting involved, by inquiring, and by planning and testing things out, and by listening to things like podcasts. That's the only way I've got around the jargon in my particular field, mm. <laughs> which I still struggle with. And the final two are assessment, which I'm not going to go into, and innovation. So I mean, innovation seems to be everyone's keyword at the moment. But uh, the key point here being a huge emphasis on the value and encouragement behind innovation rather than just blindly regurgitating facts, questioning them and thinking about new ways to test accepted facts. Mm, and, and new ways and better ways to teach. Yeah. Um, and go on, I now. was going to say, and that's the same thing with assessment. One, Once again, coming back to this idea of let's test a student's ability to think as opposed to their ability to memorize large amounts of facts because that seems like quite a shallow level of knowledge as opposed to the very deep and sort of hyperlinked level of knowledge that students now have access to even even through things like the internet. Yeah, absolutely. And and personally as a student that's not how I learned, but that's why I did uh, I'm a I'm a for for the listeners that I don't know, I'm an appalling student. <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have said this at the first podcast. Um I I've never been a good student throughout my years at university or at high school, uh, because I have this complete inability to understand facts. Um I can understand frameworks but not facts by themselves. <laughs> Which just seems like that the system would have failed you. I was able to, to memorize stuff, but I just felt a lot of the time it, it was kind of like well that's great i've memorized it and then six months later it's gone yeah uh, which seems like a, a terrible waste of time really uh, i'm not sure 